the next speaker is Dr. Maria del Carmen Garrido Navas. Hopefully that was halfway correct. Um, she's um, working together with Ariane much more closely when, with me, actually. So I would like Ariane to introduce you and, and your talk as Ariane is my co-chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Carmen, I'm happy that you also are able to join our symposium today. And um, Carmen is a PI at the University of Granada and works basically or mainly on the early detection of colorectal cancer. And I think this is also the part of the project where um, we work together. So um, Carmen, please go on. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm enjoying so much the, the webinar today. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, cool. So, well, I will be talking today about the concept of cancer interception. Um, so first, I will start introducing this concept. Then I will try to explain you how we can implement this in colorectal cancer settings. And I will explain some of the uses of liquid biopsies in this, in this context. And finally, I will give some examples of the current trends of cancer interception using liquid biopsies. Let's start with the concept of cancer interception. This is in fact not a, a novel concept as it was first defined by Elizabeth Blackburn but back in 2011 as the process of interrupting carcinogenesis at any point before the development of an advanced disease. And the key here um, is that for many years we have been focused on advanced disease. However, uh, we all know from epidemiological studies that cancer survival is greater when cancer is diagnosed at an early stage. Um, so in fact, we can talk about uh, different cancer interception models. And if we focus on the later stages of the disease, what we try to avoid here is a metastasis. So we try to avoid a dissemination of the disease. Um, however, if we try to identify biomarkers for early diagnosis, and recess stratification, we are trying to avoid cancer. And this is what we could call cancer interception. We know the survival rate increases significantly in these early stages and decreases a lot considerably in advanced diseases. However, the less advanced the disease, the fewer biomarkers we can analyze. So we need now very extremely sensitive procedures and highly precise by specimens here in, in this area. And for a long time, the tissue biopsy has been the only biological material that we have studied that it contained cancer biomarker. But the reality, as we all know, is that uh, tissue, tissue biopsy provides a, a limited information in terms of time and tumor heterogeneity. And of course, it's an invasive procedure, so we cannot repeat it on demand, and we cannot use this approach um, as a routine procedure. So liquid biopsy here plays a very important role because we know it's an non-invasive uh, method that allows us to collect uh, samples at different time points. And this will allow us to um, monitor the patients at different stages, not only later stages, but also early diagnosis and even pretumoral diseases. So how we can uh, apply this concept of cancer interception to, to colorectal cancer? To do so, we need to understand the disease progression. And as you all know, um, colorectal cancer arises primarily from polyps um, that are a result of a hyperproliferation of the colon epithelium. And then some of these polyps start to, to um, grow and the epithelial serration and dysplasia starts to occur. And these adenomas might become precursors of adenocarcinoma, which is the latest stages of the disease. If we intercept here um, metastasis, we're focusing on the later stages. The idea now of cancer interception is to move into pretumoral disease stages, even uh, in the polyposis uh, stage in which we can identify biomarkers for the disease in an state that is curable. And this is very important. Um, and regarding the knowledge we have uh, in the molecular setting, we have been studying colon cancer for over 20 years, and now we can classify uh, the, molecular, um, the molecular characteristics of the tumor. And we can do a lot in the later stages because we, as you already have presented, we have many targets for, for drug uh, therapy. 
and, and we can classify the different tumors and this is associated with prognosis. But in the earlier stages, we're lacking this characterization because this characterization at the molecular point is very immature at the moment. We are lacking a lot of information and therefore we cannot look for these biomarkers. So the idea of cancer interception actually is to prevent cancer. And there are many screening strategies that they are already implemented in the clinics and they help us to classify patients based on the risk of developing cancer. Uh, and even though since their implementation, these uh, screening methods have uh, decreased um, the, the diagnosis at very late stages, um, these uh, screening tools have some disadvantages. Some of them are invasive, as you know, like colonoscopy, and other, like the stool test or the CT colonography, they might provide false negatives or, or false positives. So this highlights the need to also develop other tools uh, for, for detecting these early biomarkers. And liquid biopsies may play a role here. Um, so what uh, we can do with liquid biopsies and how we can use them uh, for intercepting colorectal cancer. Um, we've been discussing about the different types of uh, liquid biopsies in the colorectal cancer setting, mainly uh, circulating tumor cells and cell-free DNA have been the two uh, master biomarkers, although some other like exosomes or platelets are also being explored. Um, but if we look at the clinical utility of, of these liquid biopsies, um, we have been discussing the whole morning about using them in later stages uh, for giving or providing information regarding the, the treatment and disease evolution. So we all know that they can be prognostic, predictive, and monitoring. And in this sense, we will be using them as some metastasis interception tools. Uh, what um, the, the trend now is that we try to study much earlier disease stages, and we try to use them as a diagnostic tool and also as a risk stratification tool. Um, so I'm just going to give you some examples of the use of CTCs and cell-free DNA in this, in this setting. Regarding metastasis interception, it's well described, and we all know that, that uh, pre- and post-surgery CTC counts are associated with disease-free survival and overall survival, and also allow us to differentiate between the tumor stages. Um, so they, we know they serve as a prognostic and predictive tools. But in fact, it's not only the CTC counts, but also the genetic and phenotypic characterization that give us a more uh, comprehensive information. And for example, we in this paper, we recently described two distinct CTC subpopulations in which we could even identify um, expression of pd one and BRAF mutation in the CTCs of early colorectal cancer. And we know these biomarkers are usually commonly found in, in later stages, but if we find them in, in earlier stages, we're actually identifying individuals suitable for particular um, clinical management. Then if we think about CTCs um, as a cancer interception tool in very early stages, um, this is more tricky because we know CTCs are very scarce in blood. So this low frequency um, is impacting uh, tremendously in the clinical utility. Um, but even though they're difficult, there are some groups identifying uh, CTCs or epithelial cells in, in blood of pretumoral stages. This was the first study from, from Panto um, in which they identified circulating epithelial cells in 53 patients with non-tumoral colon diseases. And they did so by comparing two isolation technologies. Later, these authors um, also analyzed CTCs, in this case, using a, a negative selective enrichment strategy. And they detected uh, CTCs in colorectal polyps and no metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. Um, finally, in this other study uh, in 2019, uh, Cyan colleagues, they use a platform, CellMax, to analyze CTCs in over 600 Taiwanese individuals, of which, as you see here, there were uh, 182 uh, healthy donors with a percentage of CTCs. So all in all, these results indicate that patients with benign inflammatory colon diseases, they can harbor circulating epithelial cells that can be detectable with the current methodologies. However, just detecting them 
it doesn't have all the clinical value that we're looking at, and we need to characterize them deeper in terms of genetic and phenotypic um, characteristics. Now, looking at cell-free DNA, we've been discussing a lot in the whole morning, but just a brief um, summary. Um, we, we know that the cell-free DNA levels are increased as the tumor uh, increases in a stage, and we know the, the concentrations levels are directly dependent on cancer stage, with the metastatic stage showing increased levels compared to the non-metastatics. However, the concentration um, has, beyond studying the concentration of cell-free DNA, um, as you presented before, Ariane, we are focusing mainly on somatic mutations, right? We are looking at mutation to monitor how um, the clonal evolution of the disease is, is progressing, how we can change the treatment, how we can target new clones. Um, and this is useful for monitoring and predictive regarding treatment, but this is uh, difficult to implement in the, in the very earlier stages. And as we have been discussing, there are many platforms, some of them based on uh, PCR, some of them based on NGS. They try to identify these targetable uh, mutations in cell-free DNA. But if we move to a much earlier stage, uh, we cannot just focus on somatic mutations because we all know, and Helen already discussed about this earlier, that we all have uh, somatic mutations, uh, germline mutations in cell-free DNA, and this can give some false information. So we need to expand to other approaches beyond uh, mutation detection. And this is just a summary. You have described um, many, many others, but we know methylation patterns help us to early diagnose um, the cancer, also in advanced adenomas, which is a pretumoral stage. And we can see different methylation levels in, in this group of individuals. We can as well do fragmentomies, as you have nicely uh, described before. And there is also this, this study uh, from this year in which they develop a predictive and diagnostic algorithm um, which determine a common exonic signature uh, to differentiate between metastatic, no, non-metastatic and healthy donors. So um, just as a summary and showing some of the trends of cancer interception now in the field, it's important to mention that there is a growing market in the colorectal cancer screening that is trying to use non-invasive tools, including cell-free DNA or even CTCs or both, and they are combining them with different other biomarkers. Um, so for example, here, the ColorWard, which is uh, FDA approved, uh, uses methylation patterns together with KRAS mutations and immunostochemistry. Um, the epiprocolon, also FDA approved, look at, looks at the methylation patterns of septinine. Um, and then we have the Colosure, uh, which looks at the methylation patterns of Bimentin, but this one is not FDA approved, only LDT product. And finally, we have the colon ES, which is interrogating more than 20K methylation sites. You see that the sensitivity is re reasonably good in some of them. But for example, when we look at uh, advanced adenomas, the epiprocolon, for example, has a very low sensitivity. So these are screening methods out in the market. There are more, I'm sure, under development. But now the trend is not just screening for colorectal cancer, but going for a more multi-cancer screening approach. Um, these are some of the examples, like the cancer seek, Pansier, or even the gallery test from Grail, which are analyzing either point mutations, uh, methylation patterns, combining also with proteomics, and this is the, the trend now that we are trying to combine different biomarkers, most of them non-invasive uh, based on liquid biopsy, but also others. And in fact, I think this multi-cancer screening is the one most likely to be used uh, in general symptomatic individuals because it's not biased to a specific cancer type. And this could be a model in which this kind of screening can be implemented in the clinics. Um, so basically, uh, we can combine the cell-free DNA analysis with the clinical um, analysis, and we combine them. So the fact that a patient tests negative for a CT uh, result doesn't mean necessarily that this patient doesn't have to follow the standard of care or screening. But if it does test positive, 
we can do a more precise uh, management for this patient. Of course, it might need to go to invasive uh, diagnostic workup and we'll need further analysis, but eventually we will have a more open view of what to do with, with this patient. So just to finalize, um, I think the analysis of cancer bar interception biomarkers uh, must incorporate as well artificial intelligence algorithms because we are generating mass massive amounts of data. Um, we need to combine it um, from the multiomics point of view, not only looking at cell-free DNA or CT DNA, but also proteomics. And also um, we can use this AI um, and other computer-based aids um, such as augmented reality or virtual reality using imaging uh, for diagnosing, also for guiding surgery or even treatment. And I would say that as a conclusion, um, basically we need to combine multiomics uh, and liquid biopsy assays and artificial intelligence together with imaging. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude by thanking my, my group. We are the Luke Bavsi and, and Cancer Interception Group in Granada in the Genius Center. Uh, Maria Jose Serrano, she's the, the PI of the group. And finally, I would like you to remind you that we are hosting the annual Congress of the International Society of Liquid Bavsi in Madrid in November, and we are still opening for receiving Astra. So just save the data, and if you want to, to join, we'll be happy to see you there. Thank you very much for this uh, really nice presentation. Um, I do not see any questions right now in the chat, but probably I one question I would have is because you, you mentioned um, that circulating tumor cells are also quite have a potential to add information to ctDNA. And I hear that quite a lot, but what I'm reading is always um, CTCs are difficult to standardize. So what do you think, how, how far or how soon could this be also implemented as an additional marker or, or what are the current main limitations for this? They are very difficult to be studied and the pre-analytical and the isolation technologies are very different. Um, we, I mean, I guess it depends on which kind of biomarkers you want to analyze. But now we have moved to a um, multi-parameter analysis in which we have much more information and we can combine this whole information, not just gene expression, but all, all sorts of size, um, uh, granularity and other, other markers that we can combine all together. And I think the more data we'll have, um, the best we, we are in a, in a good position to, to try to implement it.